Happy Resurrection Sunday, Church. You can tell it's Easter because I've even taken the time to put on a tie for you, even though I'm fully aware that you're sitting there in your pajamas. But at least there's this. You still don't know, is that guy wearing pants or not? It's probably an odd way to start an Easter Sunday message. And here's another odd way to start an Easter Sunday message. I'm going to tell you about the best part of my week last week. No, it wasn't watching this. though that entertained me for hours. It was an email that came in from a member of our congregation. I'm not going to tell you who it was that wrote this, uh, and I'm not going to show you the entire email, but amongst other things, this was the part that just did wonders for me. I get it. I don't know what it was that finally clicked. Maybe it was the Power Wheels commercial. Bingo. But it's not me. My salvation is his gift to me. It's not my rule following. I follow God's rules because I know he wants what is best for me. And I can know, and I can know that because he gave me this incredible gift even when I'd done nothing to deserve it. I get grace. I'm serious when I tell you that a message like that does more for my heart than anything I can possibly imagine. And it came in the day that that message posted. And that's what I was saying in that message. I can't get over grace. So it's nice to know there's at least another member of our body that can't get over grace either. It is otherworldly and it demands my all in response. But here's the important realization that we want to focus on this morning. God's gift is grace. Grace is the gift. But how did God present it to us? How did it manifest? How did it come to us in a way that is memorable and would be unmissable? Meaning that it wouldn't be missed. I'm just making up words this morning. Check out what Paul wrote in his letter to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Go back to what that email said. I live and follow the rules because I know those rules are here for my good. And how do I know that? Because God gave me this gift of grace. That's what Paul's talking about. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You know, sometimes the amazing gifts that we get, you can think back in your mind to amazing gifts that you got, like all of those ties that you received all those years, guys, or if you're my mother, that wonderful footstool that my dad gave her for an anniversary present. You cannot be serious. But anyway, we get we get gifts at all kinds of times, whether it's Christmas or whether it's anniversaries or whether it's birthdays. But this one, this gift that we celebrate that changes everything, came at the moment that we are celebrating on this day. Really, it's why we celebrate every Sunday. It came at Calvary. That's where it started. And then it culminated at the empty tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. It came in this three-day event, the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, bodily resurrection from the tomb. That is why Christianity bears the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, and that means Messiah. He is the central hub around which all we have and all we believe is built. You remember the analogy of Christ and his church that we talked about, about how we're all various body parts? You remember that I said I'm the bicep, and then I got an email or a text message actually almost right away from former chairman of the elders here at church, Dick Mosher, who told me, well, you may be the bicep, but I'm the brain. Surely objected to that, by the way. Objected pretty vehemently. Between you and me, I think we need to be in prayer that their 50-plus year marriage survives this quarantine. She's not taking it anymore. Anyway, we're all body parts, and which part was Christ? Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church. 
Do you notice the supremacy there? You see, you cut off a head and the body won't function. I know you were hoping that I was going to show a video clip of a chicken or a turkey with their head cut off. Not going to do it. But you can picture it. But that's Jesus. He is the head of the body and without him, nothing functions. He is central to everything. That's why he says in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, this is really fascinating because this is the part where people will jump in and they'll say, oh, wait just a minute. Doesn't that mean that you are worshiping Jesus, the Son, more than you are worshiping the Father? And doesn't that upset your vision of the Trinity? And they say it in that very voice that I just gave. But check this out. This is incredible. The Trinitarian God of the universe, the God of all that is, Almighty God, the Holy Trinity, has chosen to bring all of his purposes and plans to fulfillment in the person, in the identity, and the work of Jesus Christ the Son. A physical act that would define everything. Christ is is the center, and that doesn't diminish the persons or the work of either the Father or of the Spirit. Scripture says that all the Father does is centered in His Son. In Colossians, for in Him all things were created, Him is Jesus there, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And again in John 5, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now you remember in Romans 1 and Romans 2, we spent like six weeks there in those two chapters, we found out that there is no amount of theology or study in the world that can ever unite the sinner and God. No theology will ever do that. Union with Christ is the only way that you can unite with God. This is all the Father's choice. The Father is glorified by the centrality, that is the central nature, of the Son. And the Spirit, what's His role in all of this? Well, Scripture says the Spirit actually testifies to and bears witness to the authority of the Son and glorifies Him. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, He will testify about me. Do you see now why this event that we celebrate today is so monumental? Because the Trinitarian God of the universe made Jesus the person around which all history pivots. He is the focus of all of God's work in our world. The Trinitarian God made this moment that we celebrate on this day the central culminating moment in all of history. Kind of a big deal. So big, it is a three-day event whose conclusion literally rocks the creation. Even the series that we're doing right now, the Alone series, think about it. We are Scripture alone as our final authority. And what does Scripture offer us? We come to know the person and the work of Christ through what? Through God's self-disclosure in Scripture. This is what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees when he was ripping them, saying, you diligently study the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very Scriptures that testify about me. All right, and then we saw that we are church alone in the sense that we know that the church alone can accomplish certain things in this world ordained by God. And what is it that we're to accomplish? The church does God's will by proclaiming to the ends of the earth the lordship of Christ. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so scripture alone points to Jesus. Church alone glorifies Jesus. And then the leaders of the Reformation said that we were saved through faith alone. Notice, we're saved through faith, not by faith. We're saved by grace, but we're saved through faith. 
Faith that if we confess His name, faith that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, faith that if we repent of our sins, faith that if we are baptized in obedience, God will save us by His grace. We are saved through faith. But what is that faith in? Remember, we've stressed this a multitude of times. What saves is, is what the, it's the focus, it's the object that does the saving. It's not the faith, it is the object that saves. And what is that? Take a guess. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He is God's grace. And we saw last week we are saved by grace alone. But how did grace appear? Go right back to where we started, Paul's letter to Titus, and what did he say? The grace of God has appeared, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. Now look at that word, redeemed. What do we think of when we think of redeeming something? I'll tell you what I think of. I think of the six airline tickets. Well, actually, one of those trips included my family. So it's more like 16 airline tickets that have been canceled now for me because of this virus. And you know what the airlines do? They give you a year to redeem those miles, those tickets. Now, most of those trips were for speaking events. So if they don't reschedule the speaking events and they just end up canceling it, I don't know what in the world I'm going to use all of those tickets for. Maybe they'll let me exchange them for toilet paper. But anyway, that's what I think of when I think of redeeming. Uh, There's another one that I think of too. I I think maybe of coupons, right? We redeem coupons quite a bit. Our family went for a big family outing the other day, drove to the Fazoli's drive-thru. Jenny even put on a different sweatshirt than the one she's been wearing for the last two weeks. I ran a comb through my hair. I got about halfway in before it got all gummed up. So it was a big family event. So we're driving through the Fazoli's drive through there, and Jen reaches out when I go to pay and hands me an expired coupon. She handed it to me. I looked at it. I said, this thing is expired. And she said, just give it to them. Just give it to them. Maybe they won't know. Now, being the Christian in our family, I didn't feel right about that. But being the weaker of the two of us, I went ahead and complied. And this girl took the coupon, and she kept trying to scan it with her thing, and it wasn't working. So then she calls her manager over, and he's trying to scan it, and he can't get it to work. And I'm just saying to Jenny, they're on to us, they're on to us. And she's saying, just go, just go, floor it. But instead, I fessed up, and I said, hey, that coupon may actually be expired. And the girl looked at it and said, oh, that's the problem. She took it as an honest mistake. It was anything but. You see, this is why we can never get Jerome Church window decals, because I fear what my wife would do to the reputation of our body of believers. Nevertheless, that's what I think of when I think of redeeming coupons. That is not what Titus or any of the New Testament Christians would have thought of when they saw or heard that word, redeem. You know what they would have thought of? When a first century Jew heard the word redeem, there's one thing that would have come to mind. The Exodus. That seminal moment in Jewish history when God delivered the Israelites, his people, from bondage in Egypt. And why would they remember that? Well, remember what their scriptures told them that God said to Moses. Exodus 6. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And what was God's message to Pharaoh through Moses? Well, look in chapter 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, says, Let my people go so that they may worship me. And when the Pharaoh wouldn't do it, God struck the land with plagues. And he didn't just destroy their agriculture. He didn't just destroy their false religion. He didn't just destroy their impotent gods. He obliterated their pride and drowned their mighty military in the Red Sea. He set his people free in a way that the world would never forget, in a mighty act of judgment, a mighty act of triumph. Now, Scripture tells us that though we don't live in physical bondage to any foreign oppressor, we too are or were enslaved. 
When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Remember, we've talked about that before, that all this stuff that we think we get to do when we're not part of the Christian club, I can free, I can do whatever I want to do. And here we're seeing, yeah, all of those things lead to death. That isn't something to brag about. You see, because the master of death is tricky and he is a far greater enemy than Pharaoh ever was. We are enslaved to the curse of death as we watch our loved ones snatched away from us and we recognize that our own death is imminent. But just like God destroyed the power of Pharaoh in order to rescue his people and take them to the promised land, God has now acted through the work and the person of Jesus Christ to redeem us as well. Go back to Romans 6. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. The grace of God manifesting in Jesus Christ has appeared that we might be freed from our sinfulness. Jesus Christ came to give himself for us, that we might be redeemed, bought back, no longer in captivity to the enemy. And here's how it played out on a morning much like this. After the Sabbath at dawn on that first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, "'Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here.' He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Two days ago, on Good Friday, Jesus uttered those famous words, It is finished. He did it as he paid the ultimate price required for God's grace. And now this. On the third day, God utters through the rumblings of an earthquake a new message. The message of redemption, a message to death and its master, let my people go. God delivers us from our sinfulness. He delivers us from our self-centeredness. He delivers us from slavery to the evil one. He delivers us from condemnation, nailing each of the accusations of the evil one to the cross where Jesus died. He even delivers us from death itself. As he said to Martha, whoever believes in me, will never really die. They're just changed to live on. Our master is no longer Satan. It is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. We now have peace and we now have hope. And this Easter, just like the others, we await the return of Jesus Christ. When on the last day, the day of resurrection, even the curse of death will be overturned forever. When that eastern sky rips open and Jesus Christ, the King, comes forward, all who are in their graves will hear the voice of the crucified, risen Savior. Death will be dealt a final blow as Jesus' voice echoes through the graveyards, let my people go. And those who hear the voice of the Son of God will live forever, praise God. And if you are one who wants that promise, make this the day. Don't wait. Pick up the phone and call me. Call the church. Email any of us. I'll wear a mask. Shoot, I'll wear a hazmat suit. And we'll do this. We'll take the confession. We'll do the baptism. This is the day of resurrection, a power that even a global pandemic cannot stop. Don't let it stop you from finding your salvation in Christ and Christ alone. God bless you all, and Happy Easter.